Sylvia and me. Sylvia and Sylvia and me. Sylvia and Sylvia. Sylvia and me. Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. Well, I am Professor Amr Shabitil Reyes, professor at Columbia University Teachers College and the author of The Cat I Never Named, A True Story of Love, War and Survival. And welcome to Sylvia and Me. <laughs> oh, super. I'm, I am so happy to have you here with, with me today. Um, these have been some turbulent, frightening times, uncertainty to say the least. And in the midst of this, your new book has just come out, as you said, The Cat uh, I Never Named, A True Story of Love, War, and Survival. And you are a survivor of the war in Bosnia. Um, you were only 16 years old back in 1992. And, it, and you lived through this with your family from 1992 until 1996. That's unbelievable. And you have one heck of a, a story. And when we mention the word, you know, there's a lot of love in there, um, people really can't understand that. So we're going to talk about that. But one of the things I wanted to um, is talk about right off the, the bat is you're, you are a professor. Education is very, very important to you. And in the opening of your book, you are on a train and you're talking about some tests that you took. How did education become so important to you from a very young age? Oh, that's a, that's a question I could be talking about for or answering for many, many days, if, if not months. Um, education obviously defines who I am professionally, not only personally, given that I teach in the field of education now as a faculty member at Columbia, but growing up um, as a Bosnian Muslim, I was born in former Yugoslavia, and I was born hated simply for who I was, a uh, Bosniak or Bosnian Muslim. And uh, growing up, I never once read a story uh, like the cat I never named where the main character was a Muslim girl or a Muslim boy or a Muslim child. I was very much into math and physics. I would call myself still a math and physics nerd, um, but I never solved the world problem growing up in former Yugoslavia that had a Muslim name um, in it. And um, so my only way to really succeed in a system that systematically discriminated against me was to be better than anyone else. And one way I could do that was through education. So education was my focus from the time that I was a little girl. And um, as you know, from reading the book, there's a moment in the book where my father um, is afraid that we will be all killed, executed, Serbs are burning, um, and, and just for those who are not familiar with the war, um, they, will re they will see in the book, if they pick it up, um, to read it after our conversation that Serbs were the dominant ethnic group and they intended to simply execute all Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina where I lived. And so there's a moment where the military is coming to essentially um, kill us and my father turns to me and says, Amra, um, I may not be able to save you anymore. And if um, you survive, there's one thing that no one can ever take away from you, and that is your education. And that is really the idea that has guided me my entire life. Well, the book starts off, as I said, uh, 1992, you were 16 years old. And you're, you're coming back from taking these tests because you are um, looking to prove yourself in the education is that, but you're also a 16 year old and you're actually having a party for your 16th birthday. It's at a time where you could finally maybe uh, do something. Um, and you actually have three best girlfriends. And one of them is a Muslim girl, a Serb girl, a Serbian girl, and a half Jewish girl. And that kind of says, that the fact that when you grew up before you were 16, your friends, they, they came from all different 
ethnicities. Um, it wasn't a question that, that uh, you didn't have any friends, that people didn't, um, it didn't congregate with one another. How, how did it start where all of a sudden um, these young girls that you knew for some time um, were no longer around because now they've left and you're, you're there, you and your family, and all of a sudden um, the, the utter um, feeling of not just not belonging, but the hatred that is starting to pour out from around. How did you, how did that affect you? And that's a silly question, truthfully, but how did you manage to keep going? I mean, it was four years before you left. So can you give us a little insight how was at 16 years old, you were able to, um, to go through this? Mm -hmm. Well, the, first of all, the, the, there's an aspect that I want to mention that I think it's really important to be mentioned in this conversation because of where the United States and the world is today in terms of hatred. And that is that narrative is what matters. The stories that are told is what matters. And the stories that were um, told prior to the war of Muslims were that we didn't deserve um, to be really living as part of um, sort of a European cultural um, um, community, that we didn't belong, that we were a form of ethnic impurity that needed to be eliminated. And to be very honest, as you know from the book, and I think as most genocide survivors will tell you, and if we were to ask someone who survived Holocaust, I suspect they would agree, and that is that you don't expect something like this could ever happen to you. Um, the expectation is it happens to someone else in a distant time, in a distant land. It can happen to me and my family. I haven't done anything wrong. I was a 16-year-old girl who loved volleyball, who was about to fall in love with the boy for the first time. I was into mathematics and physics, and I was even interested in fashion. And so to expect that someone wants to exterminate me and my family was not something that I could really understand from the get-go. And just as an example, I do mention, I won't go into all the details, but um, I, uh, I go to that trip to take a test in Belgrade, Serbia, where a relative of mine lived and one of my uncles who was part of my family by marriage. So he was a Serb and he was an officer in the very army that ended up executing me. So to think that someone's uncle um, can actually become part of the effort to eradicate you is really impossible to imagine unless you have lived that kind of experience before. And um, so, so having that mentality and going into the, into the entire war and genocide experience was extremely difficult. And as you know from reading the book, there are extremely painful moments, but there are also some comic moments. There are some moments that um, um, reflect that we were still human beings and we're still human beings. And I always remind even my students in the class, my children, their friends, that um, one can be a genocide survivor, but I'm still a woman and I am still a human being who wants to engage in normal sort of life and activities. And that's what we try to do during the war, build a life that's as normal as possible in entirely abnormal circumstances. And we see that um, kind of resilience happen today in America where people are like you and I, we're not meeting in person. We're trying to find ways to connect with each other because we're ultimately social creatures and we are ultimately hopeful and good people. I do think that narratives of hatred, I think narratives that uh, misuse or abuse the narrative sort of religions um, which has happened in, in my context and it's happening here in the United States with prevalence of Islamophobia still. Uh, I think those kinds of narratives seek to initiate conflict, to initiate hatred, to initiate fear and my story is and my survival and my own resilience was an attempt to counter that even in the midst of the war. As you know during the war I focused very much on improving my own learning and my own knowledge. We didn't have normal schooling the same, in the same way that children today cannot physically often go to school. 
but um, I found an old English dictionary that my dad used when he was in college and I decided that I would memorize every word of English. And that really helped me um, in terms of coming to the United States. I wouldn't have made it um, up to this point if I didn't spend that time studying English. In addition, I studied math and physics and um, eventually participated in some national competitions that led to a scholarship um, and um, eventually me coming here to, to the United States. So I think my message to your listeners who may find themselves in a difficult moment is that I hear them, I feel their pain, I have experienced it, and I can certainly tell them that one needs to focus on what's internal to them. Sometimes we can't control how much somebody hates us, how, how much somebody wants to target us, but what we can control is what's internal to us. Well, another thing that, that you do talk about, um, that I've heard you talk about, is um, you did, uh, as you said, it, you know, it, life as you knew it was no longer. Your family was trying to survive any way they could. There were times when there was certainly not enough food on the table. Um, and so you started tutoring um, English. In fact, you actually uh, became a translator, I believe, uh, the International Rescue Committee. Uh, but you, you had a, a real desire to not just improve yourself, but to give yourself a reason for people, for your being. And you talk about empowering and how empowerment has to come from within. And it sounds like that's exactly what you found. And that's one of the things that you're trying to teach to um, your students and empowering uh, women. This book was written as you as a 16 year old going from 16 to 20. Um, it's, it's focused on a teenager's life. And it could be said it's directed to written for teenagers, and yet it has so many adult um, uh, themes going through it with war and survivor. How do you see it going across generations? Mm -hmm. um, those are all excellent thoughts and ideas and really questions. And I, um, you're absolutely right. I wrote this book as a 16-year-old um, or, or capturing the period in my life from 16 to 20, but that was primarily because I wanted to be honest with when this experience occurred and really focus on telling the true story. But the book is more than appropriate for um, really any, any subgroup in terms of older ages because of the lessons that it has in it. And I think for me, the biggest realization in the war was what you had already mentioned and something that I try to remind my students who find themselves in a crisis moment, and that is that we can't wait for someone else to empower us or for someone else to build our resilience. And for me, resilience is not being invincible and, and not uh, being someone who can never cry and, and feel the pain of what they're going through, but it's really about resisting that moment of crisis when you are about to falter and give in to whatever is happening around you to say, no, I can last for another day. And one of the things that I've often said to myself in, in, in the moments of war and sort of desperation and deep depression that I talk about in the, in the book is that I always reminded myself that one day that passes and each day that passes, I am one day closer to the end of whatever this horrific experience is. And life is full of surprises. And I, and I always say life is beautiful in a sense that I could have never envisioned that I would be here speaking to you in 2020. I thought that there were really only two options for me. One was to end up in a rape camp and end up on the pile of dead raped girls who were Muslim or being blown up as a bomb, uh, by a bomb. And I used to, in my own little teen head during the war, hope and in my own way pray that I am blown up in an instant and that that is the kind of death that I experience. And so the fact that I didn't give up in those moments and that I kept pushing myself 
that I made my own light when we had no electricity, just as a reminder to, to your listeners, we had no electricity for four years. There was no Google, there was no internet, there was no entertainment. We had no books. Um, my windows in my home were boarded so that the sharpness from the bombs wouldn't kill us in an instant. So I was really at risk of dying at any given second. Uh, but one has to be able to find something within themselves that tells them, I have a purpose, I am a good person, I will make my life worth living, even if it is for another 24 hours. And that is really the message that I stuck to throughout the entire war in order to be able to, to be where I am today. Well, you call the book, uh, The Cat I Never Named. Um, and anyone reading the book will go, well, wait a minute. Um, the cat all of a sudden shows up when some refugees, you're, you're among some refugees uh, for the first time, and all of a sudden there's a cat uh, next to you who will not leave you. Yet you kind of called the cat Moxie, I believe. Um, so although you say the book is the cat I never named, why is the the cat kind of has a name. <laughs> Excellent question. And I'm just going to use this opportunity to share with your viewers uh, the cover of the page and, and uh, of the book. And um, this page shows me with the bright red hair. You can see that my hair is not red right now, but I love changing hair color. So that's <laughs> one of the things that I did. Um, and Mati is um, right with me. And she was uh, really the light through the entire trauma of surviving genocide. And I won't go into all of the details, but I will share that I would have died, um, as you know from reading the book, along with my brother, if Mati wasn't there on the very first day that my city was bombed, June 12th, 1992. Four of our friends were blown up and my brother, younger brother Dino and I lived because of the circumstances that Mati was involved in. And um, when, I, when we were thinking about, uh, with Bloomsbury, uh, about the title of the book, one of the, um, one of the really simple things that I said often in, in conversation, the cat, I referred to Matsi as the cat I never named, um, and then sort of reflected on it that, wait a second, she actually did have a name, and um, it's just that we never really had time to think as a family how would we name this kitty who comes into our life and becomes a savior in many moments during the war because of what was happening to us? Uh, Mati means kitty in Bosnian, and we just started calling her kitty, and she was there, and she became critically important to my survival and survival of my family. And so the title really um, uh, uh, is intended to communicate uh, the message I wanted to deliver, which is that when one is surviving and when one is starving and escaping bombs and escaping rape camps we didn't have time to think about how would we name um, a kitty she just uh, simply became our matsi um, an irreplaceable member of our family it is only subsequent to the end of the war and after that experience that i reflected back and thought wait a second we never even thought about how we would call Matsi anything different than, than Matsi. And did she maybe deserve uh, more thought in terms of her name um, uh, than we had given? And so the title really communicates sort of the, the intensity of the emotional experiences that took us away from ordinary things that we would have focused on had it not been for surviving the genocide. And yet she wound up with a fantastic name. I think so. <laughs> so uh, you know, sometimes we think too hard. We I'm probably do. We probably do. I would agree with that. But that's, as I say in the book, sometimes it's a reflection of good people, right? That we question ourselves. We think um, um, how we should act in certain circumstances. And I think that defines a thoughtful individual. And um, I try to deliver that message in the book as well. I want to jump to 2016 and how it came about that you knew you needed to write this story. There are two uh, really fundamentally important um, uh, moments that 
defined or, or predetermined sort of when I would um, sit down and begin to write this book. Um, this story has been in me my entire life. My students have often said to me, Amra, what I remember from such and such lecture is the story you share, then when will you put it down on paper? And so I always knew that there would be a moment when I would write the story, but life was busy. I have two teen daughters. I have traveled around the world working um, on issues in education in other countries and doing a lot of teaching here in the U.S. And so it um, always uh, was in the back of my uh, uh, head in a way, but never was the priority. And then one day my younger daughter, Dina, who was in third grade at the time, came home from school and she asked me, mom, what will happen to me and Jana, her older sister, if you and dad are rounded up as Muslims or immigrants and taken away? Will we be left alone? And that was really the question that jolted me, that scared me, that terrified me. Um, that here I was hoping that my children would never experience what I had experienced and my young daughter who um, is a gifted um, um, individual, uh, uh, an excellent student, a kind friend who was born and grew up in New York City was afraid that her mom would be taken away simply for who I am. And so that target that has been on, on my back since I was born was sort of with that question reattached um, to me again. And when Dean and I had that conversation, and of course many subsequent conversations followed not only with Dina, with her older sister and so on, but um, during that initial conversation, um, there, was, um, there was sort of a flashback of memories that I had um, of the moment when I first entered the United States. And just to share it with, with your audience, um, I was a broken individual, a broken young woman who was 20, who knew that I was hated viscerally. I had only a few dollars in my pocket. I spoke broken English. And I was um, terrified of what would happen when I come to, to the U.S. border. I did have a scholarship as um, as again, as I mentioned, as someone who is a math and physics nerd, I was coming here as a student, um, but I thought America wouldn't want someone like me. I thought I would be rejected. And then there was a moment when I approached the immigration counter and immigration officer started examining my papers for a long time. And as you know from the book, um, I still through that time and still sometimes do, if I, if I don't eat um, frequently or if I starved a lot in the war, uh, my blood pressure would go down. And so I was sort of feeling that I was about to pass out. Um, and this immigration officer reached out with his hand. And I think he realized how terrified I was. And he reached out with his hand and touched, slightly touched my fingertips. And he said, ma'am, welcome to the United States of America. I am sorry for what happened to you, but you are safe now. And so we had, I have goosebumps. I have physical reaction to every time I tell that story. And I've shared it many times um, because it reminds me of the kind of America that I entered. And I believe in the possibility of that America, America that welcomes people for who they are and that does not reject anyone based on any sort of um, racial, religious uh, background. And those were the two moments, really, that memory of the America I fell in love with and my, um, my daughter's question that made me sit down uh, within days and decide that it was time to write my story. Well, as a matter of fact, you know, I had mentioned before that you had three girlfriends, all from a variety of different ethnicities and backgrounds. And I believe that there were four important people who precipitated, and um, to others, uh, 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 you being able to come to the United States and then when you were here, and they also came from a diverse background. You had a Jewish philanthropist, you had a woman who was a Quaker, you had a Catholic sister, and a Muslim with some serve in him. So you started off growing up with, um, with a diverse group of people around you 
and it shows that all the way through your life to to get to the America that you um, you had you were afraid to be there, but it was an America that welcomed you. You had four other, at least, people from, from a variety of different backgrounds who were instrumental in helping you get to America. And then um, from there, you said you, you, you had a full scholarship to Brown, which you earned, um, to masters. I mean, what you've accomplished is amazing. Um, but there's, uh, you know, you talk about self-empowerment. Um, we talked about the hatred that was felt against the Muslims. Um, is is uh, Islamophobia. It was different before 2011. Um, and then, 2001, I'm sorry, before 9-11. And then everything changed. What are some of the things that you are really focused on in, in teaching not only your students, but the messaging that you want to get out there? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is, a, this is a complicated question. I teach an entire course on, I love your question, Sylvie, I have to admit that. Um, um, I am teaching this semester an entire course and you're welcome to come as a guest anytime you like. Um, on Islam education and radicalization, where we actually talk about many of these issues of um, number one, prevalent Islamophobia, but also marginalization that happens in um, educational system that sometimes leads people to radicalize. Um, as an example, I had a couple of years ago, a Columbia University graduate, a student who was never my student, who never met me, who never took my class, but who um, sent me a threatening letter, um, essentially citing um, religious texts uh, saying that as a Muslim, I, will, I should be banned from teaching, that I am not allowed to teach as a Muslim in America. And you can imagine how that can impact someone like me who has gone through everything that I had lived through and who has really dedicated my entire life, professionally, personally, to try to counter all these kinds of discrimination and racism that we um, uh, encounter in the US and around the world. And so one of the things that I've done was to use that threat after I made sure that I was in touch with NYPD and, and uh, security at Columbia University to make sure that my students are safe because this was pre-pandemic and so we were physically meeting. Um, but I went into my classroom once I knew that the student didn't have access to my students really for their own safety. I went into the classroom and um, we dissected using different theories and different content that we studied in the class. We dissected this message to understand where this hatred comes from. And one of the things that I will say is that that was one of the most enlightening moments for my students who realized how consequential that kind of hatred can be, where someone is hated because of an idea or a stereotype or a bias, but not really even known to, to the person who is targeting them. And so I always advocate for storytelling as an important way to yes. bring us together. And I think you and I, before we started recording an official conversation, we talked about the importance of talking to each other. Yes. I think when we get to know each other in a more meaningful way, we get to feel emotions of appreciation and respect and um, affection that we don't have when we only rely on sort of the media that often does engage in, in some of these uh, negative narratives or political leaders that advocate for some kind of hatred or othering of the other groups. And so, but I think that wherever you are on a political spectrum, I think hearing someone's story, getting to meet a person and understanding how much they have suffered because of a label attached to them is a very different experience than hearing the breaking news and what someone uh, decides, what kind of language someone decides to use to portray a particular group of people. Um, I think you are, you are so right. 
and especially in everything that we're going through in, in, the, present, uh, in, in the present situation where we're at, people do not communicate. People are so quick to put labels and hatred is so easy for so many to fall into. Uh, you know, it's always said, uh, the opposite of hate is love, the opposite of love is hate. But is it really, and where is that middle where you do wind up um, with some understanding and mitigate that, that, um, that feeling of hate and maybe get to actually know uh, what the person is made up of instead of, as you said, this is, you know, this is who we, we um, think they are, this is what the definition is, and not look any further than what they've heard mm -hmm. instead of what people communicate. Um, Amra, if there is one message that you want to leave, I know we've talked a lot about messages and we've talked, uh, we filled in quite a bit in this, in this short period of time. What would you like to, if you were talking to your, your teenage daughters right now, what would you say to them? Focus on education, education, and education. And, and that does not just mean you know, being in the classroom. Uh, it doesn't mean getting a credential or a degree. Um, I think I get educated every day in this conversation with you, in every conversation that I have. And that is, I think, something that I had always applied in my own life. Uh, my husband often jokes with me because I'll walk into a store and someone will make a biased comment or reflect on something that they just saw on TV. And they will assume that I am not a uh, a person who who has the background that I do because I am not a covered Muslim woman, and so there are all these stereotypes in our society that assume um, what a Muslim woman looks like, speaks, uh, whether she's allowed to speak or not. I mean, all these kinds of ideas have been pushed through various media outlets for a very long time. And I will take the opportunity sometimes to have a conversation for 45 minutes with someone um, to share my experience. And it is tiring and it is exhausting, but I think it is important that you engage in self-education, education of others, and that you engage in a conversation and reading books like The Cat I Never Named. I think um, the initial in inclination uh, maybe with a book like this um, for your um, audience to assume that it is a book about genocide, war, and pain, but there's a lot of love and there's a lot of kindness and there's a lot of resilience and inspiration and um, readers will forget that they're reading about a Muslim teen girl surviving genocide. They will begin to sort of recognize those contours of the events and the emotions happening in the United, St United States here and now that are relevant to how we choose to live our lives and what kind of America we want to live in um, and we want our children to live in in the coming decades. Well, um, I know that the book, The Cat I Never Named, A True Story of Love, War, War and Survival is available um, wherever you get books and Kindle and so on, but where can people find out more about you? Um, well, one thing I learned in this pandemic is that I have to be on social media, which I wasn't really super um, keen on before, I have to admit. <laughs> Uh, but they can, um, they can certainly learn more about me and connect with me and reach out. And I would love to hear from them uh, when they read the book um, on Twitter. Uh, my first name, Amra, A-M-R-A, last name, S-A-B-I-C, or the beginning of the last name, Amra Sabic, Ph.D. Um, um, and they can find me under my full um, first and last name, Amra Sabic El Reyes, on Facebook. Um, and also I have a public uh, page there, but I try to be uh, very responsive and on Instagram. Um, and I have to say one more thing that I think um, I value incredibly much aside from all the book critics who have recognized the value of my story and the book coming out in, in America at this moment. Um, I have received a lot of uh, messages from 
moms who said, oh, my daughter got this book and I just wanted to read it before she does. And here I am, it's 3 a.m. and I finished your book and I feel compelled to write to you. Um, or a message that I received a couple of days from um, a U former U.S. soldier who was a pilot serving in Bosnia uh, as part of NATO forces and was deployed around the world who um, invited me to speak to, now he's an educator himself, to speak to his class about genocide, who said, I cried through the entire book. I wish I read it before I, I was deployed. Um, so that is the um, where they can find you, but that is also one final message that I think I wanted to share with your audience that I don't want them to be scared of engaging in a story of someone who's a genocide survivor uh, because there's a lot of beauty in, in stories like ours. Yes, there is, and there's a lot to be learned. Amra, I want to thank you so much. Um, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Sylvia, so, so much. Thank you. Right, don't go any place. Um, wonderful. Thank you. You're, yes, you're yes, amazing. Thank, thank you. You are too. Uh, that, that, that was great. So this, this class, um, that you're doing, um, are you doing in class or are you doing virtual? It's virtual. Yeah, it's virtual this year. And what's interesting is I have a lot of international students, um, who are obviously interested in this topic. So I have students, interestingly, from Israel to Pakistan and China. And as you know, in different cultural contexts and country contexts, everything that we talk about may not be permissible. Right. In China with um, uh, what is happening with genocide against the um, ethnic minority. So it's very, it requires me to stay true to the content and talk about it, but also recognize that my students are in, not in the United States where we can, for now, still freely discuss these issues. That's true. That's true. Well, if there's anyone that I can jump on, I would love to, uh, to be, you know, to, to join in and, and take a look because as I said, I've listened to a number of your lectures. Um, yeah. uh, there was one you did about a year ago uh, in 2019. Um, for the for the college and I I, I forget I that's why uh -huh. I have people say it was on on empowerment women's empowerment lecture yes which you know to me that's that that is my main thing is is mm -hmm. empowering women and, and telling you know making sure that women know that they they we might have won a few things we have a long ways to go we need to keep at it and we can um, so. Why not? The woman I put out uh, today, and I put your I put your name on the mailing list, so you'll look uh -huh. awesome. um, Patty Russo. She is the director at the Yale, the School of, for Campaign at Yale. Oh, I, that's the one I watched. I okay. watched that. Uh huh. And we taped that before, right before lockdown, right before quarantine. Um, but I knew that this was the time to put it out. And she's amazing. So, uh, so it's, uh, to me, we we need to keep at it. And the message that you're that you're putting out there is is so important because there's so much misinformation out there. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. So, uh, I'm gonna make sure. Um, in, interesting, you mentioned the Columbia lecture because Columbia reached out to me and said, "Can we?" Can we do another lecture because I'm doing all, all these different interviews relating to the book. And so we will, I want to say it's October 19th, but I'm going to double check. They're working on the invitation. So I'm going to make sure to invite you. I'm having conversation with the same journalist who did that lecture with me a year ago. And it seems like we did that a decade ago based on. There's so, there's so much, there, there is so much material to, to, uh, that we could touch on. Um, but you know, people have short attention spans. So if you right. start throwing too much at them, at some point they're gonna tune out. Um, if you keep giving them information, they'll come back for more. So I definitely um, keep in touch, um, send me that invitation. Um, and as soon as this vaccine, one that Dr. Fauci will actually take himself. 
10 months, then we're going to meet. I, I would love that. I don't know when I'm going to, to air this. As I said, I, um, um, as I'm going through, uh, it'll probably be in, in another month or so, uh, I'll air it. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll connect on all the social medias. I'll look at that because then when I do put it out, I, I um, publicize it for at least a week and, and you know, we'll go back and forth and you'll be able to put it up on your, on your website if you want. Awesome. Awesome. And Sylvia, I would love for you to send me also your email or I'm not sure do I have your direct email or not. So that way I can make sure that I put you on the invitation list. I'll send it to you. And the one thing I need is um, just a photo because okay. if you take a look, uh, when I do put it out, I have a photo within you know the graphics that I put out. Okay. So. I think you, once you send me the email, I'll just yep. reply and I'll send you the photos. But that way, I can make sure that you're included in this conversation. And there may be other conversations. I know that Brown University, um, obviously where I got my undergrad degree, they just asked me to, they asked me to do a couple of different things. Um, so once that is out, I'll make sure I, I send it. And then one more thing in terms of the class that I'm teaching, I am trying to work to, to make this virtual experience. I, I love being with students in the class because I have a lot of energy and I feed on their energy and, and it's, just, it's just a different experience. Yeah. Uh, but this year, this semester, I'm trying to organize presentations by my students that would be delivered um, through Columbia Global Centers in countries where some of these conversations are tricky to have. Right. Um, um, around the world. And so we're trying to develop series. Um, and if I can make that happen, then I would love for you to also get an invitation. And that way you actually get everything that we've discussed kind of over the course of semester, students will incorporate in what they, what they teach, what they lecture um, about. Definitely. Islam, education, Islamophobia, exclusion, radicalization, and so on. So there are a couple of things that I'm thinking about that I think you would enjoy. Fantastic. Awesome. Um, this has been great. And I will send you, when we get off, as soon as uh, I save this, I'll send you, uh, shoot you over an email. And uh, I look forward to further communication. Same here. Thank bye, you. Sylvia. Oh, bye. Thank you, bye. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms and of course our website, sylviame.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned. <laughs>